Okay, so today's episode, I'm joined by a special guest. He's in the Aviation Operations Department at the Bureau of Meteorology, and I'm not going to say that word right, so I'm going to say Bureau of Met, and in particular, a specialist in tropical weather covering the top half or so of Australia. Um, so today we're going to get into a topic a little bit different to normal. We normally talk about thunderstorms and things, but today we're going to talk about the dry stuff and have a look at the dry season and the weather conditions um, sort of across the top head, top half of Australia. All right, so from the Bureau of Met, welcome Harry Burns Fab. Thank you, Trent, for having me. And yeah, keen to have a chat about the dry season today. Yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, look, it's it's obviously you've been involved in a few of the CASA uh, wet season seminars and they're things that often happen. Uh, everyone's of interest and probably a bit more of a threat overall. But I find certainly being up here, the dry season has a very different sort of format but it's just as threatening at times uh, with winds smoke and uh, fog and things so we'll get all into that really soon but um, let's just talk about uh, met because I know it's something that's always fascinated fascinated me and a lot of others so first of all what got you interested in um, meteorology and um, yeah we'll, we'll go from there yeah, it's, it's always good chatting about that because, yeah, chatting to pilots and people in the aviation industry are always very keen on it. I guess you experience it daily. So, um, yeah, that firsthand experience is always good to chat about. Um, what got me into meteorology? Um, I think I do a lot of outdoor type activities, camping, hiking, mountain bike riding, that kind of thing. Um, you always need to know what the weather's like for those kind of activities. So I guess it it came from there and um yeah being i guess um okay at physics and maths throughout school kind of steer, steered me into that kind of area and um yeah here we are i guess yeah fantastic so it wasn't like um in twister or something where you you, you saw your parents sw- sucked away from <laughs> a tornado or anything like that <laughs> No, there's, I, I'm from Victoria originally, but um, yeah, looking at those, you know, cold yeah. fronts come through with the big thunderstorms, a bit of hail and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, it's always pretty interesting. And yeah, especially up in Darwin as well, there's, there's some pretty juicy thunderstorms around and yeah, always good to, to have a, a look out as they roll through. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And look, for, for someone listening, what's the process? Um, so are you, I guess you're a scientist. Um, what, what's the pathway? Like if someone wants to get into med, how, how do they go about that? Yeah, so we have meteorologists from, I guess, quite a diverse range of backgrounds. So some have come straight from university. Some have had other careers as, you know, pilots, engineers, scientists, some weather observers as well. Um, basically, I guess, to be eligible to apply for the, the intro me- to meteorology course, which is um, a graduate diploma, which is about eight months of training. Um, basically, you need an undergraduate degree and you need some kind of maths and physics to second year university level. So basically, uh, for example, I studied physics and mechanical engineering at uni. And I guess that was, yeah, with a focus on thermodynamics, which kind of what the atmosphere is, all these fluids uh, moving around when they heat up, cool down, all those interactions. So, yeah, um, yeah lots uh, lots of that kind of technical um, background. So they're the, I guess, prerequisites you need to, to get into that. Um, yeah. All right. And where, where does the, if you wanted to do it, where does the Bureau of Met sort of have bases? Is it in every state and territory or is there a main, where's the main hub? So for aviation forecasting, we our two operation centres are in Brisbane and Melbourne. So we also have a very small team in Canberra embedded in air services as well. So yeah, the majority of our um, aviation forecasters are in yeah either Brisbane or Melbourne. Okay, so and much the same as the uh, air traffic control sort of split up then. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. All right. And. So the Bureau of Met is obviously responsible for a hell of a lot and uh, forecasting and things. So from the aviation perspective, what, what's the, the main responsibility there and how how does that sort of get divided up? Have you got a team that just looks after TAFs and another one that looks after area forecasts or how does that all work? Yeah, so yeah, like you said, we, we cover a huge amount of the world's airspace. Basically, 
we cover the two Australian flight information regions. So I think it's roughly like 11% of the wealth airspace or something. So yeah, lots to look out for. Uh, we do forecasts from the surface, you know, your aerodrome forecasts, your gas, all that kind of thing, right up to, um, you know, the top of the atmosphere. So we send out um, routine significant weather charts right up to flight level 630. Um, but yeah, also produce warnings right through that airspace from, you know, low level SIGMETs or AMETs for fog right through to high level volcanic eruptions. Um, the way it's divided up, um, so we've got our two uh, centres in Brisbane and Melbourne, and we have basically one person looks after each GAF area, so each graphical area forecast area. So what they'll do is on every shift, they will come in and um, write all the products uh, contained in that area. So the GAF, all the TAFs in that area, uh, plus any other uh, things as they might might pop up. So if you need a SIGMET for that area or AIRMET or aerodrome warning, they'll also um, be responsible for that. So a large part of the job is also, you know, you send your product out the door, but you need to keep a close eye on it because if if things deteriorate or things change or even if, if the weather clears up earlier than expected, something like that, you need to get in and amend the products. So, you know, the people using the products have got the latest information at hand. Um, so yeah, that's I guess roughly how it's all uh, divided up. We because we work in two centres, it's um, it's a little bit more fluid. So we can you know move products from one person to the other. If for example there's a tropical cyclone off the coast of WA, that person's going to be very busy. The NT might be quiet, so we'll you know get that person in the NT to help out with those products as well. So there's a bit of flexibility there too. Yeah. Okay. So I guess, yeah, the, there's, there's both a Australian interaction, but also I guess you're interacting with other international um, MET services because how does it work? I guess, well, what, um, was it Krakatoa, I think, we just started sparking off a couple of weeks ago so in Indonesia there. So how, how do you guys sort that out? Are you reliant on them to notify you or something or have you got your own detection systems or...? Yeah, a little bit of both. So we we have uh, what we call our hazardous weather unit in Melbourne who look after uh, our volcanic ash service. Um, and they also have to yeah produce signets for um, a lot of the Indian Ocean as well because, yeah, as you know, there's a border with Indonesia there. So there's a lot of collaboration we need to do with the Indonesian um, MET service, which, yeah, I guess these days um, a lot of it can happen online. So, you know, we've got you know, online chat rooms where we can discuss, you know, boundaries of SIGMETs and that kind of thing. Uh, volcanic ash um, advisories and forecasts. So we we produce advisories for in the Indonesian region as well. So yeah, huge amount of airspace to cover. And yeah, as many of you know, <laughs> there's a lot of volcanoes in Indonesia and not many in Australia. So that's where most of the focus is. And mm. there's a number of ways we, I guess, are alerted to that. So one of them is satellite. We've got, you know, 10 minute rapid update satellite imagery. So you can see, you know, something puffing out the top of a volcano. Um, but we obviously keep a close eye on the usual suspects that are continually erupting. Um, we also rely on, um, I guess, more basic forms of communication, such as like Twitter and Facebook, because locals in that area might start, you know, tagging this uh, volcano because they're taking photos of it erupting real time. And so, yeah, keeping an eye on those feeds, you might be able to get a five or 10 minute jump on some satellite imagery or even from the um, trained volcano observatories and things like that. So um, someone's TikTok lots feed. to look out for. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fascinating. All right. And I, I guess that extends like how, how far out like so if uh, Qantas or someone's going from a flight from Australia to uh, the US for example or London how far out do they go to get our met service before the information is then handed over to another department how does that get from Intel I've actually done that sort of thing with the international side of things so how does that all sort of group so I get one big flight route of uh, weather uh, yeah, so we will produce 
forecast just for the Australian flight information region. So if you're flying into another one, you'll then have to go to that um, disseminator, disseminator of uh, forecast information and get the, the information relevant for wherever you're flying. So yeah, for example, if a flight is coming yeah, to or from the US, they may have to go and, and look for that information in a few different sources. Um, I know, yeah, the bigger airlines will have dedicated um, meteorologists uh, mm. within them to actually get that yeah, information absolutely. and compile it and do the flight planning and all that kind of stuff as well. Um, but yeah, for example, if, if you've got a flight coming in from the US, you know, it's, it's a long flight, They're, they could be looking at the forecast up to 20 hours in advance to, to plan their flight. And then um, obviously, yeah, check in as they're flying over locations because they may need to um, change a course if, you know, things pop up at the last minute. So yeah, Definitely. there's a lot of, um, yeah, short-term, long-term forecasting. Um, yeah. No, definitely. No, it's a lot of responsibility. You just um, certainly for most people, it's just whether the washing is going to stay dry. But for us, it's obviously a, a, <laughs> a fuel consideration and um, yeah, having somewhere to go early as things change because we know it can just change and doesn't matter how good equipment you've got. Sometimes it's not going to tell the story. So let's let's have a bit of talk about that. So obviously, um, how long you've been in the beer of Met now? Or how long you've been doing aviation forecasting? I've been doing it for uh, six or seven years now. So okay. yeah, mostly um, I, I was living in Darwin for a couple of years before I moved to Brisbane. So yeah, that's where I, I guess, learned the ropes up in the Darwin uh, forecasting center there. So yeah, yeah. I, that's that's where the kind of tropical, I guess, focus uh, came from there. So yeah, good yeah. place to learn lots of, lots of action in the, the wet season. Yeah, all right. And, and then that time then, so what have you seen uh, changing in the tools available? Obviously, you just mentioned satellite. I'm sure that's probably been a, a major player. But uh, do we have other ground stations or other things that have changed that's really helping be more accurate with the sort of predictions that you're able to put together? Yeah, I think um, satellite is, is a massive one. We, we're pretty lucky to have 10-minute rapid update imagery which comes from a Japanese satellite, Himawari 8, uh, which, you know, Japan is basically due north of Australia. So we they cover the same um, area of the globe as us. So having that 10 minute um, imagery is invaluable in seeing, you know, thunderstorms develop in real time. And I, yeah, I, I haven't been around as long as some, but yeah, when I started, we only had half an hour imagery. So even in the last couple of years, we've really yeah, seen wow. that um, update. And you, you talk to others who have been around a bit longer and they talk about, you know, you're getting satellite images every two or three hours. And by that time, the storm might have popped up, dissipated and <laughs> disappeared, <laughs> you know, so too late. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. It's, it's almost like that. Um, you've, we've got radar and we've, you know, all had radar for a long time. And, and that's that kind of, you know, five to 10 minute um, update cycle as well. But having that, satellite imagery cover the whole of Australia. As, as you well know, it's a very uh, sparsely populated place. So getting observations in Australia is extremely difficult. And yeah, we've benefited hugely from um, satellite imagery there. Um, and I guess the other thing that's probably led to a lot of um, improvements in the forecast skill is the um, increase in computing power as well of the models. and satellite also feeds into that given that yeah it's a sparsely populated place with few observations and because we're surrounded with by ocean there's also very few observations around us so for the computer models to perform well they need a lot of good information to go in them to say you know this is what's happening right now let's try and predict the future if they don't have that this is what's happening now you know initial state down pat then they're not going to do a good job so yeah, yeah. it's a, a lot of um yeah i guess increase in skill there from that satellite in gestation so yeah that's an interesting one the ocean so do you have like do you go put a little met station on top of an oil rig or do you rely on uh, marine feedback like so we'd sort of do air reps i guess they can do a sea rep or something like that or is it really more the satellite imagery that you've got to rely on 
we do, yeah, we do have, so there's a few islands around Australia, but not many. Um, we've got, for example, Willis Island in the Coral Sea. We've got a radar and some observations there for, I guess, early detection of tropical cyclones. But yeah, we do rely on ships as well to send in their observations, um, which um, can fill in some really good gaps. Um, a lot of offshore oil rigs and that kind of thing will also send in observations, especially because they have, you know, helicopters or other, you know, aircraft going to and from them quite regularly. So to mm. get the latest information from that for them, they they also, I guess, need to provide us with some some observations to, yeah, give us the best information of what's coming now. But um, yeah, the satellite really helps to fill in all those gaps because it's yeah, it's a vast ocean out there. No, it's huge. No, it's, it, when you fly. Um, let alone sail, I guess, yeah, you see how big this place is and like how you know what is going on. Exactly. It's pretty impressive. <laughs> exactly. All right, well, let's, let's talk about that, uh, the accuracy and information. So one of the probably the biggest changes recently, we've moved from uh, a TTF and a TAF to a, a TAF-3 arrangement. And I know certainly when I ask a lot of pilots, uh, some are aware of it and some are sort of, oh, that's that three-hour thing. Um, so how, how are these changes sort of led to the TAF-3 uh, coming about and is that more in line with international standard practice or is something that we're doing here? Yeah, it is. And uh, one of the biggest reasons we changed or, or got rid of the TTF was that it wasn't compliant with international, um, with ICAO. So basically international pilots were flying into Australia and they weren't familiar with the TTF. So it's, yeah, there's a bit of a discrepancy there. So they were purely reliant on the TAF, whereas our local pilots were familiar with the TTF and could use that. So there's kind of that, um, yeah, gap in the service, which, yeah, poses a safety risk, I guess, if, if people aren't getting the latest information because um, the TTF wasn't a, you know, familiar product, then, yeah. So that's basically, I guess, why we got, rid of the TTF and we didn't want to just, you know, can the service and leave everyone high and dry. Um, so what we've done is, yeah, gone with the TAF-3, which is basically, um, you know, it's formatted in the same way as a normal TAF. I guess the biggest difference is that, yeah, we issue the TAF-3 every three hours and we basically, as a forecast, we basically have, you know, reminders that pop up for every observation coming in for that aerodrome. Um, to you know reevaluate re as we go, even if it's um, you know pretty benign conditions, we want to make sure that the latest information's on there, so that it's yeah it's it's a I guess more responsive and um, higher priority service than your standard TAF. So it's kind of taking I guess a bit of both um, and trying to incorporate a bit of the TTF in there to make sure that yeah everyone has the latest information wherever they go. Yeah. Okay. So the TAF three or just TAF in general, obviously, is one of the, the big one that we really plan our alternates and and that sort of thing from. So how how do you decide? Because obviously, the one of the things is I've been standing at Darwin. And there's been a big thunderstorm to the TAF uh, to the south. Sorry, but the TAF is clear. So obviously, it's working out what's going to impact the aerodrome perimeter and what isn't. So. How the hell do you do that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and, and <laughs> yeah, with something that needs to be accurate, if I'm coming from 20 hours away, I don't want to yeah, arrive and feel like now I have to try and divert back somewhere. So yeah, how does that all work? Yeah, it's it's um, a good question and it's, it's not easy. <laughs> There's <laughs> lots to take into account on the TAF because it's such a detailed uh, product in such a small area. So... Yeah, like you said, you can have a storm rolling in, you know, from the south in Darwin and, you know, based on information um, from, you know, radar, what the winds are doing, all that kind of thing, um, past history, climatology, we can kind of assess that storm and, you know, assign a probability of basically, you know, how likely it is to impact the aerodrome or not. So, for example, yeah, in Darwin, what will happen is the storms will start rolling in from the south and they'll basically hit the sea breeze, which is coming in from the northwest. And as they do, the cooler sea breeze air will just 
kind of erode the storm and it'll collapse, which is, um, yeah, pretty common. And we kind of, yeah, joke that, you know, that just hits the barometer traffic lights and <laughs> yeah. gets a red light, doesn't go any further type thing. So, that yeah, dome. that's, yeah. I guess, one of the, yeah, exactly. So that's one of the big things um, is to take into account those local effects that, uh, you know, on the graphical area forecast, that whole area says thunderstorms, but, you know, here versus here might not get a thunderstorm because of these really subtle, you know, local effects such as sea breezes or even like topography. If you've storms coming off the ranges and they, they may dissipate if they, um, yeah, come into a different area and, and that kind of thing. So um, a lot of, yeah, really fine scale um, meteorology goes into it. And like the computer models are getting better at that, but they struggle to, I guess, um, yeah, do it in that much detail. So that, that's where a lot of the um, experience in the forecasters comes into play. And a lot of the, yeah, really subtle things that you'd be keeping an eye on, they might seem pretty simple and trivial, such as, you know, what the dew point or the, the wind speed, wind direction is doing at, at certain time of the day, but it has a big impact on what actually will evolve throughout the rest of the day. So um i guess that's the shorter term um forecasting for the TAF, and then as you go out further so you know sometimes we produce the TAF out to 30 hours darwin's a good example of that um you start to rely a bit more on those computer models as you're looking 30 hours in advance you also look at you know what happened today is that going to happen tomorrow what's changing from today to tomorrow are the winds doing the same thing? Is the air mass the same? That kind of thing. And then you can kind of see, well, you know, we had a storm come through at 04 Zulu today. That's probably not going to happen tomorrow because the sea breeze will be delayed so that if it comes yeah. in, it's probably more like 05 or 06. So that's the kind of things you can, yeah, kind of use to tweak the forecast from, from day to day as well as, yeah, not purely yeah. just relying on model data because you can pick up on where it does and doesn't do well. And those models, I'm just I'm just quickly trying to look one up. And I just can't think of the. There's there's a few different models that are used for um, the cyclone predicting, and all, again, we won't get too much into the wet weather stuff. But are they all Bureau of Met computer models, or are some of those independent agencies that are responsible for that, and everyone shares? Or yeah, some are, some aren't. So I'm sure a lot of you have been online and gone to um, third-party websites where you can access some of that model data. Um, so there's a few, yeah, freely available uh, models out there. Uh, we get, we have our own model on our, let's run on our supercomputer. So we have a global model that, yeah, resolves the whole planet as well as, um, city scale models for all of our capital cities, which yeah, predicts, well, uh, produces a forecast in yeah, really fine scale detail up to 10 minutes um, for the, yeah, okay. uh, yeah, basically the city areas. And we, yeah, like you said, we also use um, some other global models such as the uh, EC, so the European model, the US model, that kind of thing as well. And that, um, yeah, I guess when you're looking at like tropical cyclone forecasting, can be really useful to see all the different, you know, trajectories, for example, see which, um, yeah, may or may not come off, that kind of thing. Yeah, brilliant. All right. And aerodrome warnings, what does it take for weather to be significant enough to, yeah, just sort of hit that aerodrome warning tipping point? Yeah, so uh, we issue aerodrome warnings for quite a few phenomena um so the i guess the the most frequent ones are thunderstorms or yeah strong winds basically mm. aerodrome warnings uh primarily for you know people on the ground to say well there's a thunderstorm rolling through you need to be you know off the tarmac and in, in in you know somewhere sheltered um, yeah. or maybe you need to you know tie down your aircraft because there are you know winds coming through that kind of thing um, the lead time, I guess, varies a bit given the phenomena. So for example, like a tropical cyclone, we aim to put out an aerodrome warning, you know, 12 hours or more in advance, because you've got a kind of a good fix on where that system's moving. 
thunderstorms, as you're <laughs> probably aware, can behave a little more erratically. So we're looking at around one to two hours in advance for thunderstorm aerodrome warnings. So for example, yeah, if you're seeing that thunderstorm rolling in from the south in Darwin, um, and it is on the forecast and we're expecting it to, you know, roll into the city and over the air, airport, um, usually can get a, I guess, a fix on it on the radar and then get a, a closer timing. So then that's when we, you know, put an aerodrome warning out to say, you know, these hours, it's pretty likely the thunderstorm will impact the aerodrome. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Gaffs and the grid point wind temperature charts. When, that, when they came out, um, it was sort of sold as this is the graphical forecast you all asked for. And we all looked at each other and go, what are they talking about? <laughs> I've never even <laughs> heard of this thing. Um, I think since it's been implemented, we all get it now. And um, yeah, makes a lot more sense. But was that another sort of a ICAO format push or is that an Australian thing again? How did that come about? Um yeah, I think a little bit of both. Like we definitely looked internationally to see what works already. And our gaffes are, you know, we had a look at, yeah, what the UK did, what I think a few other countries did and kind of picked apart their products and saw what, what might work in our context. And um, that's where the, you know, the actual format and everything came from. Um, and yeah, the, the text-based text -based products we did have were, yeah, I guess pretty limited in the information we could provide in them, like trying to describe a spatial distribution of a phenomena using PCA points or, you know, locations, lat longs, that kind of thing was a bit of a pain. <laughs> so <laughs> being able to, yeah, pick, draw, draw a nice squiggly line around, you know, where the storms are, where the fog will be, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, make a lot more sense for us. And there's also a a push um, not only in Australia, but internationally to move towards more of a data focused kind of uh, product generation. So then when we did implement the GAFs, we, we also now have the ability to yeah generate all that information in um, code so that it can be ingested into yeah third party apps and systems and that kind of thing. So then um, people can yeah use that data in the way that suits them as well. Yeah, that's funny. Actually, I was literally with a student yesterday um, for IFR, just pulled out the PCA. And um, I said, I remember when we used to draw lines between, <laughs> like, a, are we behind or in front of the yep. front and all that sort of stuff? Yeah. Um, yeah, we did the nah. same thing on our desks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nah, awesome. All right. Well, look, let's, let's move into some of this um, top of Australia weather and again I'm happy yeah it doesn't have to just be that territory focus we've got people listening from everywhere so from from WA I guess dry season we're really talking broom a bit south of broom across to what Townsville Cairns sort of area yeah yeah for sure I mean even even in Brisbane you know it's it's drier in winter you don't get as many big storms mm. rolling through and that kind of thing for but sure. yeah like you said we're not at the moment talking <laughs> Not at the moment, yeah. It's a bit wet today. Um, but, yeah, we're talking kind of that northern part of Australia up up in the, yeah, Queen, Queensland north, um, NT and, yeah, WA north kind of gaff areas, I guess. Yeah, all right. Well, that's probably what I would say is probably the most notable ones um, is the wind. So there is always, like, I've sort of got a new instructor and I said, yeah, you know, you'll know that you'll just wake up in the morning and then suddenly it's just, you're not sweating, it's cool. And the winds just start picking up and it can be gusty on the ground for the first few weeks. And after that, it seems to settle, but there's this elevated wind level from three, 400 feet up, and some up to some 30 odd knots sometimes. So what's triggering that change? Yeah, so I guess to take a step back and look at yeah why the dry season is different to the wet season it's about um firstly the the wet season you have a, a focus of tropical activity in our part of the world so basically the sun is kind of directly overhead that causes things to heat up a lot and you get all that convection and a lot of activity focused over our part of the world and 
you get the monsoonal trough coming over and, and all that stuff. And the winds come from more so the, the north. So you're getting the winds blowing over a lot of um, ocean. And that picks up a lot of moisture and heat across the equator. And yeah, it brings a lot of wet, hot, humid conditions to the northern part of Australia. And so, yeah, in contrast, the dry season is where all that focus moves to the northern hemisphere, just to, just to the north of the equator. And that sucks all of the, basically the weather systems from the south slightly further north over Australia. So we have big high pressure systems that basically sit um, kind of over Australia rather than in summer they sit further to the south in the bight. Um, and when they're sitting over this um, land in Australia, they start to direct winds basically from the south east. And those winds travel over a lot of land and, yeah, basically dry out as they do. And that's why you feel that really dry air. And because mm. the high pressure systems are, you know, closer to us in the north, um, that's why the winds are a bit stronger. So you get those, yeah, as you said, you wake up in the morning and there's a, a nice coolish breeze with um yeah not as much humidity which is always a welcome relief yeah yeah well i know just coming from perth it's you know classed as sort of one of the third windiest cities in the world um not meaning it's always blowing blowing hard but just there's always a breeze darwin you know often it's just fairly still and very different mm -hmm. so it's definitely a noticeable thing and why is there that like I've literally just come down to about 300 feet with 35 knots of wind and then nothing and it's calm on the ground. So how does that gradient work? What's going on there? Yeah, that's uh, really typical for the, the dry season. What you have is uh, these winds, yeah, just above the surface and overnight uh, there's clear skies. So the surface of the earth cools at a greater rate than the atmosphere just above it. So you get this temperature inversion, which basically yeah. means that, you know, normally it gets cooler as you go up, but if there's an inversion, it'll be cooler at the surface, warm up a little bit and then start getting cooler again. And what that basically means for the winds is that it's a barrier. The, the air can't rise above it or drop below it. So it provides this barrier in, you know, just near the surface where it's all calm but the synoptic winds are still blowing just above it. And that's why you get that, I guess, that gradient where, you know, you're dead still at the surface and the winds are, yeah, like you said, could be blowing 30 knots at a couple of hundred feet above it. And yeah, what happens when the sun starts to actually heat the ground in the morning is that the ground gets warmer. And as it gets warmer, it then finally breaks that inversion because the winds can then mix down because they're no longer trapped. And that's why you get those really gusty winds, you know, uh, hour or two after sunrise in some places. Um, and yeah, it, it can kind of really be really gusty for an hour or two as those winds are kind of really mixing through right down to the surface. Yeah, I, it's, it's a real challenge. It's sort of something that took me by surprise because you listen or you look at the forecast or you listen to the AWIS or something like that and winds calm so you go yeah great just do a straight in approach but you're just coming down it just not stable too fast so you've got to go around and then come around to a circle and come around the other way um yeah it's something i've just found very unique um is it widespread across the the, the australia or is it very much more of a central thing or um yeah it, it can happen in quite a few locations in australia i guess a few key things that enable it is um, kind of clear nights, cool clear nights where the surface of the earth can cool down enough and um, not so much topography. If you've got a lot of topography, the winds may still hit the topography and continue to mix throughout the night. Um, and yeah, the way that the high pressure systems sit over Australia tends to direct um, those southeasterly winds over a few key locations, such as you know inland Queensland, Northern Territory, and yeah, over to to the north of WA as well um, in the dry season. So yeah, a few few things lining up at the same time, I guess. Yeah. Um, and yeah, as you as you say, like yeah, that kind of sheer across the the lowest couple of thousand feet is um, 
yeah, pretty characteristic of it. And yeah, we sometimes will, if it does meet thresholds for turbulence, we'll also put that on the graphical area forecast as yeah, those areas being um, yeah, moderate turbulence. Um, usually it doesn't get up to, I guess that severe threshold, but yeah, I guess very occasionally it could. Yeah, well, that more down Catherine direction. I think anyone that's flown into there, we all know that we're, we're in for a rough ride and it's always a throttle back and just keep it as smooth as you can, but it's just going to be a rough segment. There's nothing you can do about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. So the winds then, I guess, with that calm layer, that's really probably leading into our, our next thing I wanted to talk about, and that's the fog. So we now get into a common uh, or a typical morning fog where that, that temperature and dew point say good day and um and do their thing so why why is that i guess it's just really the, the breeze is the main thing but also that cooling overnight and the, the type of fog that we get yeah yeah spot on so there's a few things that need to line up to get fog and yeah like you said calm winds is one of them because if you have um yeah winds kind of mixing through that layer it won't enable the the yeah surface to cool off as much so you need that, um, yeah, the surface to cool down enough so that basically the dew point temperature can meet the air temperature and clear skies, calm winds enable that to happen. Uh, the other thing, yeah, obviously we need is, is high enough dew point to, yeah, meet the, the ambient temperature. And inland of, um, yeah, the north of Australia can often be too dry for fog. So what we'll see is fog forming in more coastal locations where the sea breeze has brought exactly. that moisture yeah. in the, in the yeah afternoon period the day before and there's just a shallow enough yeah layer of moisture to, to actually form the fog uh when that yeah overnight cooling of the surface happens um other things that can help fog forming is smoke and dust because then the fog actually has something to condense onto so mm. yeah as you're aware there's a lot of smoke um over a lot of parts of, uh, of northern Australia in the dry season. Um, so, yeah, yeah that, that also topic. helps fog yeah. formation. Yeah. So dew point, for those that aren't really sure, is, is that essentially a moisture content ratio of, of its ability to then condense, I guess, once the temperature is right? Or? Yeah, it's basically the temperature at which moisture will condense onto something. So if you... If you take a cold drink out of the fridge, um, if con condensation is forming on that, you know that the ambient dew point is going to be higher than that temperature of you know your drink in the fridge. So if it if you're not getting any condensation, you know the dew point's lower than whatever your fridge is four or two degrees or something. But you know typical dew points for fog to form would be up to you know fifteen to twenty degrees because that's when the the ambient temperature um will actually lower to that that temperature and as soon as it hits it then it's going to start condensing and and forming those those yeah fog droplets yeah no, that's a really good example yeah i haven't thought about it that way before but yeah when your fridge is <laughs> working properly it's you'll all think sweaty. about it tonight when you grab a drink out <laughs> i know science i love it <laughs> yeah all right and yeah so then the uh how do you you, what are you using then for those models to really sort of see the, the, the lapse rates and everything else that, that the temperature dew point are likely? Because again, I know I've been sitting on the ground at Groot at 3 a.m. in the morning um, when I was at Careflight and they were like, well, I think at one point they did meet, but I guess it's just that that breeze or the mixing that rounding off numbers and things is that just didn't quite work and I got out, no worries. But yeah, it's a bit of, it's fogs are a pretty fickle thing. It's, you can have everything right and it still won't form. Um, so there's a few things that I guess are, yeah, if, if that layer of moisture near the surface is too deep, then it can be, um, it can kind of inhibit fog formation because it won't be able to cool enough to the dew point temperature. Or if there's a little bit of cloud, you might not get as much cooling. Um, and yeah, like you said, if there's a little bit of breeze, even if the, the dew point and temperature are pretty close, yeah, it may, may inhibit fog forming as well. Um, and, and sometimes you get fog forming, you know, just up the road and 
if there is a tiny bit of breeze, but not too much, it'll start blowing down towards you. So, you know, it's a really <laughs> fine balance. And yeah, the, the commuter models we use to predict fog often just um, cry wolf all the time. They're just like fog everywhere today. Good luck um, kind of thing. So it's about, yeah, picking that apart, looking at the climatology, looking at the really small scale effects and working out you know whether it will or won't happen in these specific locations yeah so what have we got available to us um for for wind and fog that a satellite imagery useful or is it just too light and thin to show up uh what what could we access apart from the potential prediction of some of these other images um, i know we can look up aerodrome webcams so that's always something helpful i, I used to use to just see what's going on um, what, what else is out there for us? Yeah, webcams are really useful. Um, we also, yeah, like you said, use satellite a lot because, yeah, it's pretty uh, frequently updated. So every 10 minutes you get another satellite image. We have uh, special channels. So the satellite imagery we get isn't just like a, you know, your average photo <laughs> type imagery. We get that. We, you know, that's a visible imagery. We also have infrared satellite imagery and we have lots of different wavelengths of satellite. So what you can do is, um, I guess, uh, do a blend of some of those and it can actually give you the difference between the fog temperature and the ground temperature. So even if they're very similar, we can still see that on satellite with these uh, specialised um, images to, to be able to differentiate between that. So you can start to see it forming in, yeah, you know, 10 or 15 minutes after it's formed, which is, yeah, extremely handy to, to monitor and, and track that. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah, one of the ones I use is the infrared plus, um, is it Zare or Zare, Z-E-H-R? Yes. I find that one very handy. Yeah, that's, that's really good for storms. It's got that, um, yeah, shows you where those really high clouds are. So you can see basically how, how high that storm's growing and, and yeah, whether it'll continue. So that, yeah, really useful there. Yeah, it's awesome. All right, and then smoke. So this is obviously uh, man-made, um, get into that uh, process, like literally one week, residual moisture you know still plenty out there but the, the bulk is there so the grass isn't going to burn too much we've got this long grass everywhere and um we'll start burning it off so obviously that's a very hard thing to predict when someone's going to start burning off apart from prescribed burns that you get informed of um but as far as what the smoke's going to do obviously of a wind direction but how do you then get that on the forecast is that highly reliant on us feeding it back because i know for most of us, it's just like, hey, that's just the dry season and no one's reporting it. I know that I've heard the international airliners flying overhead as an American one night is like, there's fire everywhere. <laughs> how, <laughs> yeah. how does, they're like, yeah, we know we lit it. It's all good, mate. Relax. There's no one there. But how do you forecast that and uh, pass that on? Um, yeah, so smoke, like you said, we... It's, it's pretty hard to predict where a fire will start. We can, yeah, rely on some prescribed burns, that kind of information. But, yeah, uh, as those American pilots commented, there's a lot of fires in the, the northern half of Australia in the dry season. We use, again, <laughs> like a broken record here, satellite imagery to, to satellite, detect yeah. those hotspots. Yeah, so we can, we can see where new fires have started, you know, almost in real time. And then... Once we see those fires pop up, we'll investigate further. And you can see smoke on satellite imagery. You can sometimes see it in radar scans as well, which can be really helpful. And then once we've actually seen the smoke there, we know that this fire is producing smoke. We then basically have a look at the models, have a look at the observations around there to suss out where that smoke might go, how high in the atmosphere it's going to go. Um, spatially as well how far it's going to go from the source and that kind of thing and if it is you know uninhibited it can just keep rising straight up and if this you know the winds are strong enough it it may dissipate pretty quickly and not reduce visibility that much but 
um, overnight, especially when you get that inversion forming. So you've got like basically the smoke trapped pretty close yeah. to the surface and start to really reduce visibility overnight. And yeah, it, it may not improve until that inversion breaks, you know, a few hours after sunset. And then that smoke can get mixed through a higher layer in the atmosphere and yeah, kind of, I guess, dissipate a bit more. But mm. um, yeah, it's, it's, it's almost a bit more of a, a reactionary type thing to, to wait, you know, where the fire pops up and then we can yeah. Yeah, go to work working out where the smoke will go. Yeah, so I guess that the threat to pilots um, is probably that combination of that, that low inversion layer and the smoke, because that's what really condenses it and is what dramatically reduces the visibility. And we had that just the other day. Um, mm -hmm. There was quite a significant one. And, and between the Tiwis and Darwin, it was really, really thick. And actually, we had to sort of, I wasn't, but the, those that were flying had to divert a bit further east just to get where it was a little bit thinner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, really, you can, you know, get visibility down to um, only a few thousand meters, uh, especially when it gets yeah trapped below there. I guess working in uh, the opposite way is fires usually die down a bit overnight, so they may not be producing as much smoke overnight in that time where the smoke does get trapped. But you know, if it's already there and the fire is still puffing away, it's going to still yeah reduce visibility quite a bit. Yeah, and then you, you get that. I know this happened in Perth as well a lot. Um, it would clear, go out to sea, and then, of course, the sea breeze comes in, blows it all back in, joins up with the, the next day's burning, and, yeah, it can be yep. uh, quite frustrating. So I guess, yeah, just being really, really careful not if it's just dropping too much, unless you really know where the edge of that boundary is that you're going to come out of it you really need to either go higher to try and get above that layer or um, just head back. Because I know I've been uh, very close, not being visual instrument approach because of smoke. Mm. Yeah, and it's uh, um, pretty hard to represent all that information in the forecast at times, especially, you know, if you've just sent out the gaff and then a fire pops up and you're like well this is this is new so like if you do encounter smoke um or you know significant visibility reductions in a specific area especially aerodromes give us a call and let us know or if you want more info you know how high the inversion is um how um spatially distributed the smoke is give us a call and, and we can give you that um more detailed information as well yeah all right yeah well that, that leads again nicely on to the uh, the air rep side of things. So in the AIP, um, in Gen 3.5, uh, Section 6.2, we've got the whole air rep thing. And it's really talking about us reporting when weather's going to lead to a uh, SIGMET sort of scenario. So that's obviously been done uh, via air services on the radio. But do you want us feeding back things that may seem insignificant because again it might give you the the heads up that hey this could develop into something more serious later on or how because we obviously know it becomes normal for us so we sort of just accept it but again if i knew that was there might have helped me make a decision um to do something different earlier on so what would you like from uh, pilots as far as that sort of how do we go about passing it on yeah really really uh good point uh we like you know the tropical northern part of australia is, is pretty sparse with its um population so that means sparse observations as well so any anything we can get we we use we get air apps that come straight into our systems and they pop up on our alerting displays so we can you know get them very soon after they've been sent so yeah that's really useful information for us especially for yeah, if, um, yeah, things that are leading to SIGMETs or AIRMET criteria, uh, really useful information for us. And if there's something else that you, um, that is significant for, for you as a pilot, it, you know, it should be significant for us too, because we're producing the forecasts for you. So, um, yeah, either um, send an air rep or, yeah, give us a call and let us know. We're happy to um you know take any observations over the phone too if you're a little unsure of 
yeah, whether whether it might be important or not, give us a call and we'll answer the phone and yeah. Don't want everyone listening on the radio because yeah, <laughs> I know a lot wouldn't because I don't want to sound like an umpty. But if um, like you said, if it's concerning you or causing you operational changes, it's it's going to mean the same for somebody else. Um, exactly. And I guess you get all that automatic reporting from the airliners, from the winds and all that sort of stuff from the systems. Exactly. But you're not getting yep. that sort of sub sub flight levels and you know, ten thousand feet. So that's good if everyone exactly. uh, feels comfortable to pass that on and. Then ultimately you can decide whether you want to do something with it or not, but you can't do anything if you don't know. Exactly. And like we have so many different sources of information and sometimes they're complementary, sometimes they're contradicting each other. And, you know, you're looking at all these different sources of information and you need to make a decision on what, what to put on the forecast. And um, maybe that key piece of information on, you know, the smoke is actually a, uh, 2,000 metres visibility versus 8,000 metres visibility at this location will, you know, push us one way or another to send an airman mm. for that smoke or something like that. So, yeah, yeah we we can't, you know, do if uh, anything if we don't have the information there. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Point. Yeah, awesome. All right. And then I guess wind shear is probably then the other thing um that we get and again something that's highly reliant on us reporting it to uh, usually the tower at that point because it's low level so how um again i guess it probably feeds into what we we're talking before but just with the wind shear do you want to just sort of talk to us about what what it is and um it probably more an air services thing as to reporting it from the overshoot and undershoot and the severeness of it but yeah yeah, and air services passes on their, those reports to us if they're significant as well. So, um, yeah, pretty useful. They'll call us up and let us know if, if there's any significant uh, wind shear reports at a location. Um, but, yeah, I, I guess going back to those, um, the what we were talking about before with the winds, that's probably a key uh, scenario where you get wind shear in the tropics. Um, others might be, you know, tropical cyclones and that, but they're probably something that you staying away from anyway so it's that you know in the morning where you've got the really calm winds and and the winds aloft are still blowing 30 or so knots then you've got that wind shear across that gradient and yeah like you said it's you can't see it so um you might come in not expecting it and um yeah hit it at the last minute kind of thing so we uh, for you know, the models do a reasonably good job at predicting winds, but we also rely heavily on observations and aircraft observations are one of them. Balloon flights as well, we, we use regularly. So we send a few balloons up a day at um, key locations, you know, such as Darwin, Broome, those kind of places. And we, yeah, look really closely at what those winds are doing in the lower levels to make sure that, yeah, what's on the forecast is, is still representing, you know, what's what's happening above the surface. But you know, we only send balloons up twice a day. So between those times, things can change. So yeah, any any input we can get between those times that is, um, yeah, information that's not around the forecast, it's pretty useful. Mm. Yeah, awesome. All right. So yeah, th like, look, thank you so much for that. So with all that information, what if I'm going to somewhere or if, uh, this is at least going to somewhere that doesn't have... Uh, a specific forecast that's sort of plonk in the middle of everywhere. As we know, there's TAFs nearby, but just that 50, 100 miles away can still be quite a significant weather difference. Um, I know just driving from Darwin to MKT, uh, it's, it's really not that far away, half hour drive, but can be very significant difference in the weather. So how can we utilize, what's the best way to sort of uh, interpolate, I guess, the, the GAF and the TAFs and get an idea? And, is it all right to give you guys a call um, to sort of say, hey, this is what I'm doing. Have you got any more info that I don't? Yeah, for sure. Um, the first protocol is, yeah, if there's no TAF for a location, definitely utilise the GAF. But yeah, like you said, um, you can still experience quite different weather from one location to the next if they're close. So while a gaff will give you a good idea of the overall weather, it won't explain those really small scale features. So some locations we could 
you know, confidently say that won't get a storm, but that's only one tiny little location on the gaff. So it's not, you know, excluded from that storm area type thing. So yeah, for sure, if you want more information on a specific location or specific area that isn't on the gaff, give us a call and yeah, we can let us let you know what we're expecting there during the day or even, you know, there's not a lot of radar coverage in some parts of Australia. So we can look at the satellite imagery as well and let you know where the storms are going, which way they're moving or, you know, if the fog's dissipating, that kind of thing. So yeah, yeah I, that would also be, um, yeah, really useful to, to chat through what's going on and give you a bit more information. And then we can give you a call when we get there, if it's any different. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> oh, brilliant. All right. Um, look, thank you so much, Harry, for joining us today. That is just, there's some really good info there and um, really, really fascinating. So I really appreciate that. Um, if people want to learn a bit more, do you want to just run through some of the, uh, the educational materials that are available on the Bureau of Met page that, that pilots can access for their various areas? Yeah, there's some really good information on our um, external web so yeah going to aviation weather services on bomb.gov.au and there's if you scroll down on the left hand side there's a link to knowledge center which yeah contains some really good info on all of our products so there's you know brochures on you know how TAFs are coded up how SIGMETs are coded up all that kind of stuff there's also info on hazardous phenomena so there's a whole you know, a little pamphlet on fog or thunderstorms, turbulence, that kind of thing, as well as other, there's a, a flying in the tropics brochure there as well, which which goes through, I guess, the more seasonal um, things to expect in the tropics. Um, so yeah, I if, if you haven't looked already, I encourage everybody to, yeah, check out the, the knowledge center on the, the website there. Yeah, for sure. There's some really good info there. I've had a look at that. And also, um, I think you guys have got a YouTube channel as well, have you? Yeah, we do. I think it's Ask Bomb. So it's um, it's not aviation specific. It's no, kind of yeah. more generalized, but it's got some really cool animations. So, you know, for thunderstorms or severe thunderstorms, for example, it'll show you what it'll, you know, evolving and stuff. So it can really, you know, um, illustrate the conceptual model really well and help you understand what's going on, even if it is, you know, targeted to just, um, you know, the general public, still really useful. Yeah. I really enjoy watching them anyway. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. No, no, I can see you know, when you start talking thunderstorms, your eyes light up. So I think that's if, if you're willing, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot now, but if you're willing, I'd love to um, have you back closer to sort of build up time and, um, yeah, we can get into that a bit more detail. Yeah, sounds good. It's always good to chat about thunderstorms. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, mate. Look, um, in wrapping up, I've just started doing a bit of a, a little quiz. Now, normally I ask what your favourite aeroplane is. Um, I don't know <laughs> if it's so uh, relevant to you, but I thought I'll, I could adapt it a bit. And so what's your favourite weather uh, phenomenon that you personally have uh, witnessed or experienced? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I think it's pretty hard to beat the thunderstorms in Darwin, um, especially when they're, you know, you've got all day to, it's just like that anticipation all day. It's hot and sticky and you're just, you know, begging for some relief and then the storm rolls in and just like, you know, the heavens open, it's winds everywhere, you know, rain, you know, the water's just piling up on the street because it's <laughs> bucketing down. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty impressive to watch, I think. Um, so, yeah, that, that's probably my first choice. <laughs> yeah, okay. And what about being the, uh, the, the Met geek that you are, what, what would be a, a, a phenomenon that you would love to witness? Um, the... Safely. Morning glory roll clouds. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, that, that's not going to hurt too much. Yeah. Yeah, the, the roll clouds that form in the Gulf of Carpentaria called the morning glory. Apparently, yeah. they're pretty spectacular. I'm not sure if you or any I've of your listeners seen some have photos, seen them. But yeah, yeah they, that would be a, a pretty amazing experience too. Um, and yeah, so, something else that is always pretty impressive is, you know, when you go hiking and you, you're going up, into the hills or something and 
in the morning you get those really still mornings and there's some fog sitting in the valley and everything's just calm and you're sitting above the clouds that's pretty neat so yeah always enjoy yeah. that as well some some magical experience isn't it i know I, i'll never forget um my dad was a LA pilot of ANSET, so I was very fortunate back then before uh, we stopped at having staff travel and, and, and flying. I used to sit in the jump seat all the time and I never forget coming into Adelaide off the coast and there was just this bank of cloud and we're skimming right on the top of it. And then it just suddenly stopped before sort of approaching Glenelg area there and I just felt the, the, the ground from underneath <laughs> me drop and it was just this awesome experience. And I know we're so fortunate um, what we see on the ground, but seeing things from the air, it's just such a different perspective and we're, we're very, very fortunate. Yeah, for sure. Pretty unique experience. Yeah. All right. And then the last one, favorite weather movie. Normally it's a flying movie, but yeah, favorite weather movie. <laughs> I think you mentioned it earlier. I think you mentioned Twister, didn't you? <laughs> Everyone <laughs> yeah. loves that movie. <laughs> yeah. So are you yeah. are you like um you like us that every time there's a, a flying movie or TV show that you're just like, that's not what happens, or that's not how it works. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, everyone would do it for their own, you know, subject area, expert area. Yeah. I think, but yeah, there's a lot of a lot of words thrown in that don't really mean anything. But I guess you have to sit back and go with it, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, you do. You just go swallow it. Keep it for the common folk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, great. All right, Harry, look, thank you uh, for, for your time this morning. It's been fantastic. And um, I hope everybody got something out of that. And we'll, um, yeah, if you're keen, I'd really love to chat in uh, five, six months time or something when the, the, the build-up's approaching, we can have a chat about that as well. Yeah, no worries. Thanks a lot for having me, Trent. And yeah, I really hope um, your listeners got something out of it and, and learned something or, yeah, took something away. So um, yeah, thanks for that. No worries. Thanks again, Matt. Cheers. Cheers.